Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. Today, physicist Eugene Bagashov concludes his remarkable three-part analysis of Oumuamua, the mysterious object which is thought to be the first ever interstellar traveler in our solar system. In previous episodes, Eugene has explored several enigmas including the puzzle of the object's mysterious acceleration as it moved away from the sun. While this episode was in production, Eugene made a stunning discovery that may provide an essential pathway to understanding Oumuamua's trajectory. As Eugene will explain, this discovery relates directly to measurements of the interstellar magnetic field. Here I wish to discuss the ideas and intuitions, some of which might be considered fringe even in the electric universe paradigm. Yet recently I've been very interested in this topic and would like to share what I learned. A lot of what I would say was either directly stated or at the very least inspired by Jim Weninger, with whom we've had several discussions about the odd geometries in the solar system and their possible relation to its immediate interstellar environment. We usually participate together in the Electric View podcast, available on YouTube, so if anybody becomes interested in these ideas, feel free to visit our page. So the basic premise of the idea I'm going to be talking about follows from Don Scott's research into the structure of Birkeland current filaments and their radial structure in particular. Here I reference his talks at the EU conferences and also papers in the journal Progress in Physics, for example the recent one called Birkeland Currents and Dark Matter. So what seems to follow from this research is that a Birkeland current should not only demonstrate the concentration of material in cylinders embedded into one another while having the same axis, which is the axis of the current itself, but that there would also be a radial electric field between those cylinders. So Jim Weninger thinks that our solar system is traveling along such a current, and perhaps there should also be present some large-scale radial electric fields in it. And perhaps the eccentricities of the orbits of planets and the inclinations thereof cause them to go in and out of these current cylinders, which might cause the obliquity of spin axes and their precession and other phenomena of that sort. So how does it relate to Oumuamua? Well, as it was already noted, this object, if the astronomers are correct in determining its initial trajectory, have entered the solar system almost from the same spot in the sky where the solar system is heading, with respect to the nearby stars, that is, which is called the solar apex. And in the framework given above, it would be reasonable to assume that the solar apex does actually represent the direction of some large-scale plasma current that the solar system is traveling along. So again, if all that is correct, it would seem that Oumuamua fell directly down the barrel of a gun, so to speak, falling into the solar system right along the axis of the current filament. Now that line of reasoning possibly opens up some alternative explanations for the unusual behavior of Oumuamua that we've described in detail in previous videos. For example, it might be possible that the unique geometry of its orbit being directly related to the axis of this hypothetical filament has allowed the object to be charged positively rather than negatively. The viewer might remember previous videos about Oumuamua where I've analyzed in detail the significance of the lack of cometary activity of Oumuamua for the electric comet hypothesis. In short, in my opinion, any interstellar object should have a negative charge with respect to the Sun simply because it appears from outside of the solar system and the outwards electric field associated with it, by the very definition of being interstellar. And if the comets acquire negative charge in the outer regions of the system and then discharge in the inner areas with a higher electric potential, then such process should be even more noticeable for the interstellar objects that yet did not pass through this higher potential area at all. But if we assume that there is something special about Oumuamua's approach trajectory, in particular it being directed right along the axis of a hypothetical filament, then it might be the case that it has retained a positive charge with respect to the sun and or the solar wind plasma rather than the negative one. So in this light, both the lack of cometary activity seems not surprising at all, and perhaps even the unusual acceleration away from the sun. As we've already discussed, the latter one might be the result of even the simple electrostatic repulsion, or maybe some slightly more complicated electromagnetic effect related to the way solar wind plasma interacts with charged bodies. 
And perhaps it would even fit in a more generalized consideration. If we assume that most of the other bodies in the solar system have lower electric potential than the Sun, I've already mentioned the negative potential of Saturn's moon Hyperion, Comet 67P, and Pluto with respect to the ambient solar wind around them. Then, for example, it wouldn't be surprising that the Pioneer anomaly is about the acceleration towards the Sun, as the probe has also most likely had negative charge, whereas Oumuamua have experienced the acceleration outwards from the Sun, as it could have had positive charge. In this case, it seems that all that is required is to assume the existence of this large-scale filament and its direct influence on the interaction of the solar system with its immediate environment. If that is indeed correct, then, in my opinion, it would require a reconsideration of the rather simplified spherically symmetric approach to both the electric Sun and the electric comet ideas. Essentially, I'm talking about changing the basic model geometry from a spherical into a cylindrical, or at least quasi-cylindrical, where we would have a sort of a special direction, namely the direction of the current filament, and the possible radial electric fields directed to or from its axis, depending on the distance from it. In this case, even my simplified model of electric comet that I presented at the EU 2016 conference should be corrected. At this point, I'm not sure what the result of such reconsideration would be, but it's definitely a thrilling new possibility. Maybe there actually are consequences of such a geometry that could be detectable in the populations of comets and asteroids in the solar system, and it's definitely a thing to look into in the near future. Here I also wish to propose very briefly a completely different scenario from the ones previously discussed, since I don't think anyone has mentioned such a possibility yet it deserves to be present in the overall pool of ideas about Oumuamua. Now, remember that around the date of the supposed perihelion of Oumuamua, the Sun suddenly became very active, which I've described in more detail in one of the previous Space News episodes posted in January. So maybe the solar activity at the time was actually not the consequence, but the very reason of the appearance of this object in the first place. What I mean is, could it have been ejected by the Sun itself during its peak of activity? Of course, that would be impossible according to the model of the Sun that is used by heliophysicists today, but I prefer to stay open-minded, so I do not rule even such a far-stretched possibility. So maybe Oumuamua did not even arrive at the solar system, but actually appeared from the very center of it. Who knows? Then I believe it would be natural for such an object to be repelled by the sun, as it would most likely bear some positive charge of its own. Or maybe it was very light, as the solar plasma near the surface appears to be, so that it could be accelerated away by the solar light, as one of the mentioned papers propose. And now I wish to return to the geometrical considerations mentioned above, and reveal some peculiar facts that I've stumbled upon while researching Jim Weninger's ideas. So while studying possible geometrical alignments in the solar system and its stellar neighborhood with relation to Oumuamua, I've learned that somehow there seems to be two angles that keep appearing over and over between many important directions. And those are roughly 60 degrees and roughly 66 degrees. Now, I understand that this would sound like some cheap numerology, and I would myself be skeptical about it if being told by somebody else, but I cannot ignore the relation of these angles to the basic constants such as pi and e, that is, the base of a natural logarithm. So 60 degrees in radians is exactly pi divided by 3, and 66 degrees, again in radians, is very close to being pi divided by e, or alternatively, the natural logarithm of pi. That is, the power of E which gives pi as the answer. So where do these angles appear? Well, at least on few occasions that seems important for our consideration. As has already been stated, the backwards calculations of its orbit indicate that Oumuamua came into the solar system from the direction of the solar apex, that is, where the sun is going with respect to the nearby stars. And the angular distance between the solar apex and the Earth's spin axis is 60 degrees. Curiously enough, the angular distance between the solar apex and the center of the galaxy is also 60 degrees. Moreover, these three points, that is, the direction of the Earth's spin axis, the solar apex, and the galactic center, all lie almost on the same arc in the sky. 
That is, one can draw a line on a celestial sphere between the Earth's spin axis direction and the galactic center, and the solar apex would lie very close to the middle of this line. That already seems peculiar enough, but there's more. The angle between the motion of the solar system around the center of the galaxy and the ecliptic plane where the orbit of our planet lies is also 60 degrees, which is a pretty baffling coincidence at the very least. And I also should note that the solar system is moving around the center of the galaxy in the same direction where Mars spin axis points. Yeah. Now, about the other angle that I've mentioned, which is roughly 66 degrees. This is obviously the angle between the Earth's spin axis and the ecliptic. But not only that. It turns out that if we are to believe the Oumuamua's trajectory estimates, it was deflected by the Sun at exactly the same angle. So, looking from the Sun, the angle between the point of entry of Oumuamua in the solar system and its exit from here in the future is also 66 degrees. And here I would allow myself a slight digression. In the recent days, I did some parallel research into a slightly different topic, and that is the hypothesized close approach of the so-called Schultz star to the solar system some tens of thousands of years ago. Just as a mathematical experiment, I wish to see if it is possible to arrange the point of its closest approach in such a way that it would be equidistant from the points where Uranus and Neptune spin axes are directed in the sky today, and at the same time be the closest to them. I chose these two planets as they would most likely be affected the most during such a flyby as being the farthest large planets away from the Sun, at least known at the moment. And it turns out that indeed such a point in the sky exists, and its coordinates fit into the window of uncertainty that is presently accepted for the position of Scholz star at its closest approach to the solar system. So if Scholz star during its closest approach have had equatorial coordinates of 141 degrees right ascension and 69 degrees declination, that is between the Big Dipper's handle and the Polaris, approximately where M81 galaxy is observed today, then its distance to both Uranus and Neptune's north celestial poles would be minimal and equal to, you've guessed it, 66 degrees. And I wonder now, could these angular alignments that seem to occur frequently be somehow related to the general way of the behavior of our solar system in its interstellar environment? Of course, one could have asked previously, well, why is Earth even mentioned here at all? It's just one of the planets, so who cares how its spin axis is aligned with respect to its orbit? Why should that angle be somehow related to Oumuamua's flyby of the Sun? Well, I have answer to that, and that is, Earth is at least somewhat important here, because it was the only planet that Oumuamua passed very closely to. It basically crossed the Earth's trajectory, approximately speaking. So if it came from somewhere out there, possibly traversing the interstellar space along the large-scale Birkeland filament axis, and later crossed the Earth's orbit, overall being deflected by the Sun at the same angle as the Earth's axis is tilted to its own orbit, then perhaps there is some connection here. Maybe the Earth's spin axis tilt is determined by a larger scale plasma phenomena in the very same way as Oumuamua's motion was. Now here my intuition as a trained physicist tells me that it could not be that simple, and that mass of the object should matter and the actual dynamics should be considered, etc. But at the same time there is another intuition that I'd also like to share, which is the fact that even in gravitational Newtonian slash Keplerian celestial mechanics we often deal with situations where one small body orbits a large body, and here the mass of the smaller body could be easily neglected without any significant decrease in precision. So in that way we are able to say that it doesn't matter what mass planet Earth or some minuscule spacecraft has, it would still orbit the Sun in the same ellipse given the certain starting velocity and position. So maybe it would be possible someday to derive similar type of Keplerian laws, so to speak, for the objects that travel along or across the interstellar or even intergalactic plasma filaments, and here the properties of these smaller objects themselves would also matter very little. They would just follow certain orbits and organize themselves geometrically in a way that would be dictated by the overwhelming cosmic filament, or perhaps a current sheet that they are enveloped in. 
And of course, there is also a loophole here for the alien hypothesis anyway. Namely, that maybe the alien species have already figured it all out and that they've deliberately launched their probe so that it would travel along the axis of a filament. Well, I don't have anything to say about it other than what I've already said, that I would prefer natural explanations after all. But that is a matter of personal taste, I guess. Anyway, I would also like to share with you quite a shocking discovery that I've made literally a few days ago as I was studying the geometries involved in Oumuamua's flyby. But to understand how significant it is, let me first provide a bit of theory. So suppose we have a body, which is shown as a black dot on this picture, that's about to encounter the sun, the bigger orange dot. The initial velocity of a body is shown by a black arrow here. The scales are really irrelevant to the point I'm making, so disregard them at the moment. It's really only a crude illustration. So celestial mechanics tells us that if only central forces are involved, such as the gravitational attraction, for example, then the trajectory of a body, shown in red here, would lie in the same plane that is determined by the initial positions of the body and the sun and the velocity vector. Here I show this plane in purple. Seems pretty obvious and straightforward, right? Well, now imagine we have another completely random vector, shown in blue here. It is quite obvious again that the plane that is indicated by this vector and the velocity vector in the most general case would not coincide with the orbital plane, right? Now here I show this other plane in blue. So as you can see, the purple orbital plane and this new blue plane that depends on the orientation of my arbitrary blue vector are very significantly inclined to each other. Again, that should be pretty obvious and straightforward. So imagine my bafflement when I've learned that if you take not some completely random vector, but a vector of the interstellar magnetic field, then it would lie almost exactly in the orbital plane of Oumuamua. In the case of this sandbox illustration, for example, it might look like that. Here the green vector represents the interstellar magnetic field direction. Now please keep in mind that this picture is only an illustration. It's not how they are actually oriented. But the situation is the same. The interstellar magnetic field vector somehow lies in the same plane as the orbit of a body, which is Oumuamua in our case. And of course I've made illustrations showing how this actually looks in real life. In these pictures, you can see the orbits of planets from Mercury to Pluto, the plane of the solar equator, the orange one, and Oumuamua's trajectory shown by the red curve. And I've also plotted some other important directions, such as the solar apex and the interstellar magnetic field orientation. The green plane here contains the Sun and Oumuamua's initial positions and the interstellar magnetic field vector. As you can see, Oumuamua's trajectory is almost perfectly aligned with this green plane. Now there is a very slight inclination of about 2 degrees, but given the uncertainties in determining the magnetic field direction and Oumuamua's initial trajectory, which we didn't even observe, maybe in reality the inclination is even less than what is shown here. For the magnetic field direction, I've used the data from NASA's IBEX mission, with uncertainties of about 1 degree. Now, just think about it. What is the probability that Oumuamua's orbit with respect to the Sun would lie in the same plane as the vector of the interstellar magnetic field, if they were completely unrelated and oriented randomly? I'd say such probability is really close to zero. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it and deal with the initial shock of this discovery, but I can definitely say that there is something really, really important right here under our nose. If anybody has any ideas about the possible reasons for such a peculiar alignment, I'd really like to hear them out. Now, various reviews of the Oumuamua case have noted how odd and unusual it is, and how it is not clear what it is in the first place, and how it came to be the way it is. Well, I would actually think that on the contrary, Oumuamua is most likely a pretty regular and even dull object. It's just that our theories about the behavior of cosmic bodies so far were limited to the boundaries of the inner heliosphere, and by and large we have no idea what happens beyond, although naively try to extend the laws that seem to work here outwards into infinity. 
I know it might sound too reserved or skeptical, yet I do not see any guarantees that the laws of Newton or Kepler or Einstein, or even the laws of electromagnetism for that matter, would work in the same way in interstellar space as they do in our earthbound laboratories. There is a vague feeling that a lot of it might need modification later down the road when we would encounter more and more objects like Oumuamua or perhaps eventually try to reach out to the other stars ourselves. Perhaps Oumuamua have actually provided us a glimpse into the way our solar system interacts with the larger scale plasma structures around it. So what I'm saying is that maybe the similarity between the angles of Oumuamua's deflection and the angle between the planetary orbits and the sun's direction of motion, and also the Earth's spin axis, is actually caused by the influence of some higher order structuring. And to be honest, I'm not really surprised that Oumuamua's behavior looks strange at this point. In this regard, I would actually say that the strangest thing about it is that it's not that strange after all, which gives us hope that we will be able to figure the answers out someday. <laughs>